Hey guys, this is Billy from AdultCello.com and welcome back to part two of my 20,000 subscriber Q&A. Okay, so I've got a bunch of great comments and questions here. We're going to go through one by one and then at the end I'm going to go ahead and announce the winner of a free complimentary 60-minute Zoom lesson with me. All right, got a lot of questions so let's just dive right in. All right, this is from DonnaBird6368. How do you play relaxed without dropping the flow? Okay, that's a great question um, and it, it highlights a kind of a slight misunderstanding that I had for a, a period of time when I was actually learning cello, uh, you know, 16 years ago or whatever it was now. You want your bow grip to be supple, but it doesn't mean, I, relaxed is a dangerous word to me because it gives the wrong impression. It makes, when I, because what I, I had a period for months where, or, you know, maybe weeks, but probably months, <laughs> where I just had this kind of really floppy bow hand because I, they, my teacher kept telling me to relax. It was my first teacher and I was like, okay, well, I, I'm squeezing the life out of this poor thing. So let me just basically go limp, as, as limp as possible without dropping the bow. The problem is you end up basically having no control. Uh, and so, you know, bow changes, string crossings, you name it, it the bow skids out, it, it, there's no control. What you need is kind of like a supple grip, okay? That's a process. One thing I'll just say right now, I have a, a challenge I, I, I do. It's a, a bow hole deep dive challenge. I do it on Facebook. If the next time I do it, please sign up because I, I have really great exercises I came up with to solve this exact problem of how to get a comfortable grip and then also how to like learn how to sink weight into the string effectively so you don't end up just kind of squeezing and, and, you know, squeezing life out of the bow. But, but so that, that's what I would say to you is it's about developing a supple bow hand and that's a relaxing thing to have a supple bow hand but it doesn't mean that my bow hold is just relaxed all the time I wish that could be the case but it, it's not okay this is from Lahan music it's uh, five hearts Lahan thank you for five hearts I really appreciate it thank you for supporting my channel all right this question is from Nathaniel Christensen do you recommend as a total beginner to use strips of tape on the fretboard to indicate where you put your fingers thank you for your videos my pleasure and yes I do okay this can be like a slightly contentious thing but I think we have to be realistic with what we're bringing to the table okay so here's what here's my argument if you are already a musician and you have a trained ear and you're starting cello or you were blessed with perfect pitch maybe may, tapes won't be helpful and you could just kind of get on without them even if you have perfect pitch, I still don't think it's bad to have a few pieces of tape at the beginning of your journey because, you know, we're just getting the, the hand shape and kind of memorizing how far we generally open our hand, not stretch, but how, how much we're going to open our hand to cover first position. And if you're like me, I started without a trained ear at all. And I went back to school for cello, so I took like musicianship courses that very objectively showed me that I had an untrained ear. Like I, there was a quiz and I couldn't tell what kind of interval I just heard. So I had to work. Now I have a really well-trained ear because I put so much work in, but it was very humbling. And I, I, my teacher, my very first teacher, she let me put one piece of tape for, to, to note B natural in first position with the first finger on just the A string. That was her thing, is like just that little piece of tape. I honestly wished I had had the strips because I just think it's 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 a helpful thing. Of course, could it become a crutch? Sure. So so the goal is start with the tapes and then take them off as soon as you think you might be ready. You can always put them back on. But if you think like, you know, I feel like my ear, I'm acquainted with the sounds, I you know, the pitch I need to make and my hand is generally ready, like it feels pretty familiar, boom, take them off and see how it goes. Okay, so don't... Don't have them on and get dependent on them, but I would definitely start with them as, as an adult learner. I think it's a great thing to do. All right, this is from Tracy Chaffele. Uh, How do I develop consistency in my plane? I'm frustrated that sometimes my plane is okay, other teams really bad. Okay, <laughs> hey Tracy. So that's a tough one just because it's so broad. I, so what I would do is I would think, when am I consistent and when am I not? Is it I'm consistent until I have to shift? Is that I'm consistent until I have to do like really long slurs on the same bow and then suddenly like I, I halfway through the bow I feel like my tone is suffering. It, so I think you need to pinpoint 
what creates the inconsistency and then kind of attack that problem. And so it's very easy as an adult learner to be kind of critical of ourselves. I, I have plenty of it because it's like it, along the way I've had plenty of times because, you know, we have these beautiful, intelligent minds. We're totally musical people usually. We just started cello late. And so we hear gorgeous music in our head and then we hear what's coming out of the cello and it can be very frustrating. So it, I think when you say other times really, it's just really bad, I think you should consider these efforts you're making in, in the practice room as like a scientist, okay? And no information to a scientist is completely useless, okay? So what you're, instead of just kind of like that was bad, you can think like, that wasn't what I wanted. <laughs> what about it? And instead of just being like, everything, I hated it, it's horrible. You can say, okay, what was it? I was out of tune, or I missed that shift again, or every time I shift, I feel like the note after the shift sounds bad. You know, there, you can get more and more pin kind of precise about what exactly is kind of leaves something to be desired in your plane that you don't like. And then that gives you a game plan because whatever you don't like is the thing you're going to work on. Okay. So I, I think that would be the best way to develop consistency is just kind of analyze your plane and be completely honest. You don't have to be brutal about it, but just very honest. And, and then take that to your teacher and just, boom, we have a game plan because this is when I feel like I just don't play at the level I think I could be playing at already. All right, I hope that helps. All right, Simply Kate Smith, how has you and your wife's pregnancy and parenting journey altered your practice time with your instruments, if any? Many adults, including me, want to progress in learning an instrument and find it challenging when kids are in the picture. I finally understand what you're talking about. <laughs> okay, so practice time for me, Partly because I'm, this is like my profession, I can find ways to carve out practice time often, okay? It, it would mean, a lot of times though for me, it means I don't watch that show I wanted to watch. It's like I have to, like I'm so tired, we just put her down. And now because I need to practice for this reason, I'm going to march into the room, you know, and, and get it done. So part of it is just you just find willpower that you didn't have before because you didn't need that willpower because you had an uncomplicated life. Um, the, the other thing I would say is that there now are certain days where I just can't practice. And that was something that was hardly ever the case before. I could, maybe I can't practice as long as I want or you know something's going on, but in a year I would have very few days where it's like, maybe I take the day off because I don't want to practice, but you literally there's no time to practice. That happens now not all the time, but enough. And so what I, if I'm working on something or, you know, I have a concert coming up, what I would do is really work on mental practice and, and bring that in. That's something that kills me about my wife. She's so good at this. She started violin when she was four and she built, I, she never loved practicing. <laughs> so she kind of got really efficient at mentally practicing. Like sometimes we'll be talking and she's just playing a piece with her left hand on the table. And it's just run, she's just running a piece, like kind of like I would daydream about, you know, what I want to eat for dinner. You know, it's just something she does. That kind of mental practice is hugely helpful because that, you know, you don't want to be absent-minded while you're watching your eight-month-old. So I wouldn't do it then. But in other pockets of the day, you doing little, as much problem solving as I can off the cello is, is another thing that I've started doing more since having a kid <laughs> because it's like, you, you just little pockets of time are very valuable if you make them valuable. Before, I think I would have, if I had 15 minutes to, to drill something in my mind or 30 minutes to sit down and play, I would have thought, you know, like honestly, I tell people make the most of it, but for me, like, is it really worth it to even get the cello out? And now it's like, okay, I, I have this, this, this time today that I could, and I have a concert coming up or something. You better believe I'm gonna make 15 minutes count in the morning and then 30 minutes, you know, that kind of thing. So it's it's just a little bit of, a little bit more willpower so far is is but I, I do I am able to practice still but it, yeah it's it's different <laughs> all right so at switch one e what is the m one most consistent mistake you see newer players make when playing the cello and how would you recommend going about fixing it that's such a great question um, okay so I'm gonna make this as like a little more philosophical because you know. 
for newer players, there's just so many things that you need to learn and you, you make mistakes, but that's part of the learning process. Like no one, I've never met anyone who started out with a great bow grip, like that was tension free as an adult learner, for example. I don't want to just say that though, because that's like, that's just part of learning cello. What I would say, the consistent mistake I see is adult learners fixating on the left hand and not worrying enough about the right hand and, and its role in the you know creation of, of beautiful music. I think the left hand seems busier for a lot of us at first because you know we have four fingers that move independently, they play notes and you know you're you're moving all around, you're shifting and then there's of course intonation. We don't have frets like a guitar. So it can be very alluring to just sort of like, okay, I, the bow, like beautiful sound will come. I need to get this situation under control because this is crazy, you know? What I found is that the approach I, I take with my online students and, and my private students is putting sound first because the more your bow arm kind of learns what it's supposed to be doing and it, it's you develop that kind of confidence to pull beautiful sound and th that ability, a great bow arm will pull a left hand along with it. So it will help a left hand play the notes. But if your left hand is completely rock solid on a passage, but your bow arm is is not as rock solid, it's gonna sound worse. <laughs> you can't, I've, in my experience, you can't have a solid left hand and a kind of shaky right hand and have it work out. But if you have a really solid right hand that knows exactly what it's supposed to be doing, it, it can make the left hand job easier. Okay, so prioritizing the bow arm and beautiful sound. All right, this is from Valentina um, Galian 981 Hi, Billy. Greetings from Brazil. Hello, hello. Uh, congratulations for the milestone. Thank you. After two and a half years on my cello journey, I'm wondering if I someday I will really combine everything I'm studying, bow arm, intonation, smooth shifts, dynamics, vibrato. I swear, I just want to make a beautiful sound. Yeah, I, I know exactly what you're saying. I think you can make a beautiful sound today. I think part of that, and this is kind of like one of the things I try to do in my teaching, is start with a beautiful sound on open strings. I'm, you know, you've been playing two and a half years. I remember you from a Facebook challenge. Like you, you, you're totally capable of making a beautiful sound. What I would say is that you, maybe it's the way you're practicing, and and combining everything. Yes, of course, that's difficult. But I think if you maybe take an approach of like, okay, I'm going to start with open string, beautiful sound, then I'll play a scale with as beautiful sound as possible, and then I'll move into a piece, but I'm going to start practicing in a manner where I'm really prioritizing sound. So at the expense of playing eight bars at a time, 16 bars at a time, I'm going to like really see what I can do with like these four notes. Can I make it as beautiful as possible? I think if you're saying I just want a beautiful sound, that's, that's attainable quickly but you just have to practice in a way that allows you to work on beautiful sound. So if you're playing, you know, a piece that's difficult for you, which is a great thing to do, but you're doing that and then you're like, why doesn't it sound good? It's like, well, you're kind of already redlining in, in too many areas. So pare things down, build in a beautiful sound, and then, you know, slowly but surely, your shifting starts to sound more beautiful. Like everything is gonna come together because whatever you're working on, you're also trying to do it with a beautiful sound. And then that'll, I think partly be the glue that starts like binding these things or it's kind of like maybe more like a highway that connects all these little islands okay and so right now you have all these little islands you work on and you just need beautiful sound to be like a highway that you know you travel around the, all, the archipelago with okay I hope that helps okay this is from busybots9987 congratulations thank you so much thanks for sharing your knowledge and personal journey what exercise would you recommend for someone who has a trigger thumb left thumb when I use my thumb, I clamp too hard. Okay. I try playing without the thumb, but then I feel I press too much on the strings. Um, and this is Virginie. Okay. So that's a great, I think we have the answer. Because one of my, if you have a tight thumb, one of my solutions I, ha I have students do is to hang their thumb off the neck. Okay. Like off the neck while they're playing, just to convince themselves that they don't need the thumb pressing into the neck to actually get a tone. But you say you clamp too hard, or without the thumb, you press too much on the strings. That's your issue, sounds like, because that means you, you're not even involving the thumb and you're squeezing too much. And if your fingers have gotten used to squeezing too hard, 
it just like, you know, usually it's the other way around where the thumb engages and then the fingers clamp too much. If your fingers are clamping too hard and they're, they're, you're squeezing too, like working too hard to get the string down, that's a good way to get your thumb engaged because you just, it's natural for us to want to do this with our hands, okay? So what I would do is, you know, you can do an exercise where let's, I'll start on a C natural and I'm just going to make the, a horrible sound. You can start even so light that it's a harmonic. And then I'm going to slowly add weight in. <laughs> it's terrible. And then eventually, as you slowly sink weight with the second finger into the string, the, they'll be like, it'll like kind of snap into tone. And what I found is that you'd be surprised a lot of times you can get a really beautiful sound without even pressing the string all the way down to the wood. So, so you're, I think you need to work on recalibrating your fingers and, and learning the minimum viable amount of weight to sink in so that you have these kind of like supple fingers that, that sink in like, someone once said like the fingertips are like little pillows, which is a nice image. Like not, not a really fluffy pillow, but like a firm, a firm pillow. And it just kind of sinks onto the string, but it's not like I'm going to press you into the wood because boom, okay, now I'm secure. You know, it's tight. So it's finding that minimum amount you need and to, to, to play notes. I think working from the finger angle will actually help you learn how to relax your thumb while you're playing the left thumb. Okay, so I hope that helps. All right, so this is from Steve Zercher, 2455. Hi, Billy. Love your lesson plans. Working through them right now. Question for you. Do you have any suggestion on finding time to play? For reference, I have six kids from one month old to 11 year old, and I can't seem to find the time to play. Any hints would be greatly appreciated. I understand what I read, but I don't understand. In the, what I mean by that is like, I, right now, my wife and I have one eight and a half month old baby, and we're so busy now and you have six kids from one month old to 11 years old that's amazing I, it's a little hard for me to fathom what that's like um okay yeah i have some hints so what i would say is this is going to be about um like small bursts of time that are focused because if you're if you have six kids and you're still doing this you have a passion to play the cello you know and that's beautiful so what you're going to do is you're gonna to try to carve out 15, 30 minute time slots, if, if that's all you can have, or if it's 30 to 45 minutes, whatever it is, try to find a time slot. If, it's, if you can get it to be a regular time, that might be even easier, but if it has to be flexible, that can be flexible too. And come sitting down, you sit down with a game plan because 15 minutes can do nothing. If you just kind of sit down and you, kind of wander around on the cello and you know sort of loosen up for five minutes and then you have only 10 minutes left but if you're like i'm going to work on this bar this bar this bar 15 minutes five bars each five minutes each bar i this is what i'm going to work on in these bars you know that the more you niche kind of microscopic level of detail for what you're going to try to do in 15 minutes you're really going to make that time count the other thing i hesitate to recommend but i will anyway is to have your cello out and ready like in a stand with six kids, it, I think it depends on how safe that cello is going to be. If it's just kind of standing out, like if it's going to get crashed into, maybe not. But that's definitely, I think, something that can help is having your area completely ready to go. If you can carve out a little space for yourself where it's like, my practice chair is here, my stand is here, my cello is sitting in its little holder, whatever kind of, you know, cello stand you have. So all I literally have to do is walk over to my place, take my cello out, take my bow, sit down and start that that's another thing if you have to like get your case out of the closet and open it up and then it's you all this work for 15 minutes of practice you know so that that's what i would say prepare your area and have it really ready as much as possible while, while having your cello safe and then just come with a targeted game plan and look you have six kids and you're doing this like you're gonna make it work i believe in you <laughs> all right this is from lisa gergitz uh 4978 uh, I've taped my cello like you showed in your video, but there's no way my hand has that reach. Will I need to engage all four fingers at once for some notes? I mean, there there are rare times where you're literally playing like a, a, a quadruple stop where you're holding all four fingers down. Usually, that's not the case. And one thing I would say is with the tape, 
for if you have uh, like not a, an enormous hand i have a pretty i'd say like an average male hand it's not a small hand but it's it's not a big hand and i i don't like holding my hand i would never try to hold my fingers over the pieces where the tape would be in first position for example i wouldn't hold them there ready to play at all times because my hand is just it just doesn't like being that like stretch that that opened okay that much opened so what i would consider is thinking of your fingers a little bit more like feet for for a lot of your playing and that you're basically going to walk from finger to finger and just like in your when you take footsteps like if you you take a step and then you take the next step you obviously have to lift the the back foot to take your next step so if i'm on first finger and then i'm going to play fourth finger i'm going to i'm going to like let go of my first finger a little bit okay you don't want to let go and have your fingers like splayed up in the air the more they can kind of rest off like relaxed but but not completely out of position the better because it you want to be able to walk back and forth between finger to finger conveniently and comfortably so so the further your fingers go when they're not playing the the more difficult it is to get them back and the more you kind of use the tendons in your hand a little too much so I, I would just think about I'm just gonna like imagine there's a puddle and you're just gonna step over the puddle it's too wide for you to straddle so you have to do like a little bit of a step slash hop to get over the puddle and then you walk back and forth like that so it's you kind of really allowing one to four one to three this kind of stuff you really kind of let let the fingers like establish the next note and shift the weight in the hand and not just kind of hold your hand like uh, you know that kind of feeling uh, and and that i think will dramatically change how you feel about your left hand and its ability to like play the notes in first position using the tape okay this is uh lisa gergitz again 4978 when i'm bowing on the a string i don't have the arm length to finish at the end of the bow if i try to do that either i'm hunching over or the bow loses its parallel position parallel to the bridge is it okay if I stop short of the full bow length? I'm simply learning for pleasure, not professionalism. Yeah, I think if you're early on in your journey, ab you know, absolutely. Like there's, it, eventually you want to be able to get to the tip of the bow, but a lot of that ability is going to come with getting more and more comfortable holding the cello. You've, you've, you, over the months and years, you sort of tweak how you're holding the cello. Maybe you have to angle the A string a little bit, you know, to, to the, towards your right leg and that helps you kind of find your way to get to the the tip comfortably you know the and also your ability to hold the bow without tension is a huge part in being able to get all the way to the tip so if you have your standard grip and then by the time you're at the tip you still have the exact same grip and you haven't you're not pronating enough for example and really pouring the weight into that first finger on the right hand that that like ability to pronate that much will give you an extra like inch and a half of you know of distance you can get towards the tip so it's i don't think this is like a dire problem i don't think you need to expect that you'll never get to the end of the tip but just if you work on having a supple bow grip and and just really focusing on developing more and more kind of ergonomic use with the cello I think eventually you'll you'll find your way towards getting to the tip comfortably, um, and it, if you can't, you know, if we're like talking a centimeter off, it, it, it's really not the end of the world. Okay, so this is Smith Sinker, S I N C R. Uh, what do you think of the electric cellos? I'm interested in the N S C R model because it sounds the best in my opinion and will fit in the plane overhead for travel. Hoping it will keep me from missing practices when traveling. What do you think? Oh, okay. I'm not a, an electric cello guy. My whole thing for starting cello was to make the sound on the recordings I fell in love with. So for me, that most of the electric cellos, are their sound is f distant enough from that acoustic wood sound that I just never like got inspired to, to buy one and, and play on one consistently. I have played on them in the past. Um, if you know, but that's me. So if you're into electric cello and you think it, you think it sounds great and it's cool. There's absolutely nothing wrong with learning on an electric cello. Here's what I'll say though: if your goal is to eventually like work your way towards acoustic, 
especially those NS models, which is it's very minimal. It's going to be a very different feel, not only the body of the instrument, but the amount of kind of weight and speed and, and how, how hard you have to work for the sound to, to make a great sound on an acoustic instrument. I think with the electric cellos, they, they tend to be easier to pull sound. And if you want to be louder, you just turn them up. You know, it's, a, it's just a different world slightly. Um, traveling, oh my God, I, I wish. I wish I <laughs> could just travel with an NS. It, it would be amazing. Cause you know, for with this guy, I have to buy a seat um, at, the, it would, at the airport or in, on the airplane rather. Um, but yeah, I think if, if that's something that's going to get you going and, and like inspire you and you can take it with you and that way you, you feel like this is going to help you play the cello and that's what you want to be doing, then I think it's a great decision. If, you, but just be wary that it's, it's a different, I almost feel like it's, it's like a different instrument than an acoustic cello, not a worse instrument, but just slightly different in a lot of ways. Okay. That's what I'll say. Okay, this is Rene Shell 4005. <laughs> the A string, help. The A string sounds good when I practice along with your lessons, but when I'm playing a piece and the A string and the A string shows up, it's often strident in sound. Now you said the A, so I'm, maybe you're thinking, maybe you're talking only about the open A. Um, am I using too much pressure? I'm not sure what visual, visualization to use since the A may only be a quarter note long and it doesn't feel like there's enough time to visualize the surfer as in the lessons near 30 day journey. I, I mentioned a surfer when I talk about coming in on an up bow and kind of riding the, the weight you can use instead of like, you, you can just kind of ride gravity on the A string. Um, by the way, love all the visualization tips and similes and metaphors you use in your teaching, super helpful. All right, great, thanks Renee. Um, I, there's a chance that you could be using too much pressure on the A string. I sometimes, it, I this happens frequently with you know, a student who's early on in their journey is like you get real comfortable on the D string and you pull a beautiful sound and then you go to the A string and it starts to sound like just not as beautiful as you think it could be. And it, a lot of times it's because you are just kind of sinking, you're just kind of a little too heavy on the A string. Um, so analogies time. What I talk, when I talk about how to treat each string uh, to get a beautiful sound, I think of animals actually, and I think about petting. On the A string, it would be like a chihuahua. On the D string would be maybe like a little terrier. G string would be like a, a sweet but burly kind of pit bull. And then C string, I think of maybe like a baby hippo or something, okay? And so you, in all four cases, you wanna pet the animal and be like a loving pet where you're like, good boy, like great, I love you. And you sink in and enough that, you know how like on a dog, the skin on their skull it, you kind of like sink your weight in and it moves their the skin and they're like, I does this a little bit, that kind of thing. So it's like a really sticky connection with the dog, but you're not, nothing heavy. That's kind of how I think about the strings is that each string is gonna have a certain amount of weight and speed that you use. If I'm pet a baby hippo, like I would pet a chihuahua, it, it'll feel maybe a tickle. It's not like a loving pet, you know? And then if I pet, if I get used to petting a baby hippo and then I do the same thing to a chihuahua, I'm gonna like push it through the floor possibly. So it, I think if you explore speed and weight, it, you can, you want to try to release the sound and not pour, like push sound out, but coax sound out as much as possible. And I think when you say it's, you only have a quarter note long, you know, that not, doesn't necessarily mean it's not possible. Of course, it, it maybe if you're, if you feel that pressed, for time, it could be you're pressing too much. And then also maybe you're just trying to use a little bit too much bow. And so it just feels like I don't have as much time. So what I would try to do is do like a sound first approach where you hear the A string in your head and you hear the sound you want to hear and then hunt, like just take a moment and try different speeds, different weights, different placements and find that perfect amount of speed and weight that kind of releases a beautiful open, like, like that kind of like very rich open sound and then that then you now you're like okay there we go that's what this animal needs to feel loved and and to like purr or growl happily whatever you want to call it. okay i hope that helps all right this is from mongoose man um i'm getting a cello friday three exclamation points that is super exciting congrats sadly we won't be able to find a teacher for a while 
because there's not a lot where I live, but I will catch, I will watch a lot of your videos until then. Well, that's wonderful and congrats on starting. Um, I, I do have a course if you're interested in that, it's called Cello in 30 Days and it, um, that might be a good option. Uh, there's, I have a ton of online students where, you know, it's just, they live in an area where there's just not a lot of cello teachers. And so it, it can be very helpful to have online resources in that kind of a situation. But you can also just peruse my videos on YouTube and congrats on getting started. That's super exciting. All right, this is from Thomas Denev. Hi, Billy, congrats for hitting this milestone. Well-deserved and I thank you for your inspiring and down-to-earth precise support Okay, hey Thomas. <laughs> uh, my question, could you make a video about principles for phrasing music with different examples, warm regards? I could and I, I should um, and I will. <laughs> That's, it's too much for this Q&A session right now. Um, I, I, I'll just give a couple ideas for phrasing uh, music. It's such a broad thing and then it's also you start to, it's like matters of taste for phrasing. Um, one thing I really liked, I remember reading this about Casals is he always talked about notes are either going towards the next note or kind of backing away from it. And I think for adult learners, that can be a very helpful idea to use, is that you the, the kind of enemy of beautiful phrasing for a lot of adults is correct playing, where you're just sort of handling the notes and you're playing them in rhythm and you're playing them in pitch, but they're just, they're all about the same volume what they're not like leading one doesn't like lead to the next note or or die away it's just it's just kind of like processing notes with a good sound even can still leave a very like like lackluster feeling so if you start thinking about okay in this phrase like what's the high point what is the big where like where is the phrase going towards is it maybe starting high and then it goes all the way down and it's just like a slow decrescendo throughout and the energy's waning or maybe it's like a rainbow shape where there's a high note in the middle and then it comes back down you know you can start figuring out these important notes in a phrase and then you can figure out okay now I've got my point <laughs> how do I like bridge to to this point that's a that's going to create a really satisfying musical shape like a if you're talking about like the the terrain you're creating you know like a beautiful landscape um, son sonically speaking. Uh, to help you do that, the other piece of advice I would give is, it, even if you're not a singer, like I'm definitely not a singer, I, I definitely try to sing out loud even the melodies I'm working on. I try to hear them as carefully as possible in my mind. I think a lot of phrasing can be simplified by just kind of, I think we, a lot of us are naturally musical and we don't need to learn a bunch of rules as as much as we need to listen to how we would sing it and then figure out what we need to do with the bow to create that contour that we just naturally sing with our voice. So I think we sing it and we're like, oh, that was nice. That's what I'd like to hear. Okay. <laughs> but it's like, okay, well, I just sang that. Let me sing it into a recorder. You don't have to share it with anybody if you don't want. Sing it and then just be like, okay, so what did I do there? Oh my gosh, I, I've been playing this thing totally legato, but I just realized when I sing it, I put a space between every note because that's what I would naturally do singing musically. Oh, well that, that could totally change the way this sounds. And then I noticed also that I kind of like emphasize and take a little time and luxuriate on this one note. Whereas when I'm playing it, that note doesn't get as much attention. So I think kind of tapping into your, your musical soul, <laughs> your musical essence would be an even faster way than kind of I think it's cool to learn rules, but I think that that would be a great way to get started sounding more musical like in the next week. You could you could totally do that. All right, this is from Piper Lee 5163. Hello, thank you for this invitation. I'm noticing a scratchy, crunchy sound at the beginning of notes. I tried to lighten the pressure on the bow, change the distance from the fingerboard, try a different angle, no sweet spot. I cringe at the sound, which of course creates tension. That's a great thing to notice, by the way. Um, what are ways to approach building blocks, things to pay attention to? Thanks again. Okay. It gets back to the question I answered a little bit ago. Um, I think my guess is if you if you really are at the point where you can you you have the ability to lighten the pressure or sink in more, you can change your placement and, and control that comfortably. You've tried different angles. My guess might be you might be squeezing the bow still a little too much. Your grip might be a little too strong. And aside from being not super comfortable, <laughs> 
that can also make it really hard to start a note from from like a beautiful like al niente like from nothing and have it just like open naturally because if you're squeezing it i mean imagine you're painting with a brush and you're just squeezing the handle of the brush and then you'd want to like have a nice smooth stroke it's gonna be that much harder because you're just kind of gripping it so if you can try to get as much of a supple bow grip as possible and then think about like i said a little bit ago like you're gonna pet an animal okay so when you pet an animal you don't just start <laughs> it would shock the animal and imagine in this case you're petting a dog and the dog's asleep and you you don't want to startle the dog but you just want to be like oh you sweet sweet dog like love you you know that kind of thing so when you pet a dog like that you have to start very softly with a slow hand and like not a lot of weight and then you just gradually sink in and that that is a great way to start learning how to open up sound beautifully you can do that with a tight grip is possible but it's very hard because there's it it's like your fingers are kind of maxed out squeezing the stick and it gets very hard to like with subtlety like sink in weight so the more you can relax the grip and then think about especially with the first finger kind of petting petting your string and and like it's the strings asleep and you're just trying to gently wake it up and not startle it i think that image might might help okay great question this is from user FL3SV3YC70. <laughs> How do I know the type of cello to start with? And please explain the difference. Could you also recommend a beginner friendly cello? I, what I would do actually is a lot of this information I would give is in the, a free ebook on my website. So if you go to my website, adultcello.com, and then go to resources, you can find my ebook, which includes my advice for like equipment when you're getting started. Just so you know, I highly recommend renting when you start um, because it'll, you don't, if you're just starting, you don't necessarily know what you're looking for in a cello. And so if you rent first, it gives you a chance to get familiar with the instrument and kind of find out what you like, what you don't like in terms of sound. Like, do you want a bright cello? Do you want a dark cello? Do you want it to have high string tension, low string tension? You know, these, there's so much variety with what kind of cello, even, even lower priced instruments, there's a lot of variety out there. So I would start by renting. Um, explain the difference. Um, you know, I, I think if you're starting with a rental, it's, it, you know, it's, there's gonna be a limited amount you, you can choose from. But um, I, I think you just kind of get started with a rental. And then when you go, I would bring your teacher or bring, you know, if you have a friend who's a cellist, like an experienced cellist, that's great. And then they can kind of help you like try the instruments in your price range and pick from there. Um, but definitely rent to get started. That's what I would say. All right, this is from Cat FE 200 or 200. Hi, Billy. Thanks so much for sharing your experience and talents with the world um, for aspiring cello players. I started cello as an adult and have been at it for over eight years. Because I'm older and do things more deliberately, I struggle with playing fast passages. Fast. As soon as I see 16th notes or worse, I panic, my eyes lose focus, my body tightens, and things go downhill from there. My left hand struggles to play the notes fast enough while my right hand arm brain struggles to remember what to do to produce a clear, crisp sound. Please share some wisdom, how to improve finger agility and maintain focus. Absolutely. It sounds to me like what's happening is you're processing individual notes at a time, which is a very like normal thing to do because that's kind of how we go about practicing especially when we're playing like slow beautiful melodies you know there it's like you s listen for the sound take care of every note when you start playing fast passages you have to start grouping notes both in the left and the right hand okay by and this is a term that they use um, when they talk about like cerebral function is they, they talk about chunking information like languages we do that we think of we think in terms of phrases not individual words and that allows us to speak eloquently and quickly um, so it's a kind of the same thing with fast passages. It's learning how to find patterns and, and be able to group notes either by the string you're on, you know, like, okay, I have four notes on this string and then suddenly I switch to the A string and I have four notes, or it's like I have three notes and then I have to shift and then I have five notes. Figuring out ways to break a fast passage into more bite size chunks. And by bite, I mean a bigger bite. Okay, so that way your mind won't be redlining 
because you're just like, no, 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 no. <laughs> and I've been there. And that, that was what really helped me like get comfortable playing fast. And it's the same thing with the right hand. You want to figure out, okay, five notes on this string, three notes on this string, five notes on this string, one note back and forth, you know, that kind of thing. And then you're, you're now playing bigger chunks of notes with the right hand. And, and so you start to see and process those chunks as single things. So instead of playing five notes as five individual events, you play those five notes as like one thing, okay? And that will totally help you get through it. Um, the panic, you might have to actually deprogram that because it's a very natural reaction to like, oh God, this gets fast. Like, so a I think as you get better at it though, it'll kind of naturally, the panic will, will die down. But another beautiful thing is once you start doing this more, a lot of the passage work, not always, sometimes it's just crazy fast and you're just like, wow, that's really fast. Let's get strapped in for this. But a lot of the stuff that was fast passage work in the, you know, previously, once you start this chunking process, it actually feels slower. And so it's just less panic inducing because you're not, again, processing one note at a time. All right, this is from Elaine Halimi, 3821. If you had to pick one cello in the one to $2,000 range, what would that be? What is your go-to recommendation with your student? I know that's a tough one, yeah. Um, love your channel and approach, thanks so much. Um, okay, so yes, I don't have a brand in the one to 2K range. My, if I have a brand and their cellos, I think tend to start around 3,000, 3,500, it's Jay Hyde. I've just had a lot of success with that company. I think they're actually based in San Francisco. Um, uh, it's, I think, Chinese instruments, but they get finished in San Francisco. They have multiple levels of instruments, and I've just really had good experiences with that brand with my students. Um, you know, so that's what I would recommend. That's obviously over that budget. What I would do if it's a one to two k range, try to find a really good violin shop in your area, and try to find a cello there. And why is that? The, a lot of shops will have a, a cello for sale. It's sometimes a like the cello they, they're renting, you can do like a rent to own sort of situation, but it's like a base level cello. In that range of one to $2,000, such a big part of what makes it either not so great or truly a great thing to use and learn with is the setup. And at a really good reputable violin shop, they're gonna get everything right. They'll put you know, quality strings on, which makes a huge difference at that price range. They'll put a quality bridge, they'll cut the bridge correctly, so that it, it, you know, it's a perfect string height. They fit the bridge to the, so that the feet, you know, fit the, the table, you know, and so everything will be kind of by the book and set up to be as playable and as, as good sounding as possible. That, that would be my recommendation is, is try to go local. Another great thing about like shopping locally is that if you have a problem and it's a local shop, you can just go ahead and, you know, take it in versus, having to ship it back or, or, you know, try to work with customer service on something you ordered. Um, so that would be my advice. And I it may not be super helpful, but I really think that is the, the best way for, for that price range. This is M Sisley 05. If you selected me for the free one hour lesson, can we wait until I'm further along in uh, learning the cello? <laughs> okay. Okay. That isn't exactly a great question that will benefit anyone with learning the cello, but I believe that in this and that question is a question that would benefit others. At what point might such a lesson be beneficial? How would it benefit the newborn infant versus a few month old baby cellist versus toddler cellist, you know, someone versus someone who might have a little more experience and be returning to the cello. Also, thank you for your very um, kind of vulnerable vi video about what's going on with my, my shoulder and congrats on 20K. Thanks so much. Um, okay, so Honestly, my answer is that a good lesson is helpful kind of at any stage because you could even argue that a great lesson in the beginning, it could be even more helpful because if you get an insight in like, uh, like, oh my gosh, we made all this progress on my bow hold, like what, what doors does that open? Do you know what I mean? So it's true that, you know, I, it's like, should I wait until I could get a lesson with, with me or with you know, someone who I want to study with until like, I'm ready to work on vibrato. I, mean, I get that kind of concept, but what I would say is, in my experience, like, I, I've just always wanted like, the best information as soon as possible because 
it's none of this is necessarily super straightforward. It wasn't for me in terms of the, the learning curve to, to learn how to play cello. So if I can have help early on, that's maybe even more valuable than the help you get later on, um, you know, in, in certain cases. So that's what my answer would be, but uh, thanks, great question. All right, this is Denise DeLuise 911. Congrats on your major milestone, thank you so much. I live in an area without a cello teacher, so I'm learning online. I really appreciate how well thought out your lessons are, how clear and relaxed your explanations are. I'd like some advice about practicing. I know you've said not to have an excessively long practice, but I like to practice two to three times a day, It's great. But not sure if I should separate those practices into working on scales, repertoire, rhythm, intonation. Without a te teacher's guidance, I meander. Yeah, I know, I know what you mean. Um, I think you could try a few things out. Because th the other thing about adult learners is that we're fully formed people. And we have personality types. We have learning styles. Do you know what I mean? So it's, it's not, I think with kids, you can be a little more didactic, like do this. With adults, I think it's like a big part of this whole thing is what is going to get you in the chair the next day because you're excited about what you're doing with the cello. Because being passionate about learning is in a lot of ways as important as making progress. Because if you make, you're making progress but it just isn't very fun, it's very easy for the cello to kind of fizzle out of your life. you know. And obviously if you want to make progress and you're not making progress, that's going to be frustrating too. But so if you're practicing two to three times a day, I think you could, what I would do is come up with maybe two to three different like possible days. Almost like if you're going to a party and you have like two to three outfits you're gonna choose from, you could come up with two to three situations with how you're gonna treat those two to three times a day you sit down and just see if one of them naturally works for you. I, I can tell you from my own personal practice, I always start with open bows, and it's just to reacquaint myself with sound production. I, I'm very sound focused these days, and I, I kind of wish I'd been more sound focused earlier on in my journey. I think it would have gotten me further, um, faster to where I am now. Um, and I, so that's one thing I definitely start, start off with. Also, you kind of want to warm up. You don't want to just like, I, I wouldn't, what I'm trying to say is I wouldn't start a practice with like, okay, I'm going to try the hardest passage I'm working on right now, and I'm just going to run it full tempo for the first hour, you know, and then, so, you know, with an eye, an eye towards, you know, physical well-being and comfort, I would just try a few different kind of breakdowns and, and see if one really clicks and gets you excited to sit down the second time that day. And also, if you can possibly link those so that it feels like, okay, I'm going to either do something separate so that gets me excited because it's not monotonous, or I'm going to... I'm going to leave off here, kind of like Hemingway. I was famous for, he did a thing where he would always finish a short story. He'd finish his work that day in the middle of a sentence so that he could pick up that sentence and, and keep going the next day. So he never had writer's block. I remember reading about that. But, you know, just you could do something where you're trying to link those practice sessions. Just try a few things out um, and just write it down on paper so it's not like just a, well, you try something different today. Just have like a plan of two to three and see, see where that goes. That's what I would say. This is at yoga with three H's. Um, I'm really enjoying cello in 30 days and the master classes are excellent reinforcements and tips for us. Thanks so much. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. Question, how does the adult cellist know when she, he is ready to play with others? Subset questions, how do we find others to play with since we no longer hang out at a school? That's a good question. Is it better to begin with orchestra and then chamber groups, vice versa? What combination might be best? How do we get over the fear of playing with others? How do we get over thinking of ourselves as the metronome or drum beat when we're not carrying a melodic line? Okay. I think when you want to play with others, that's when you're ready. And, and now, that doesn't mean you march down and you're like, I'd like to start a quartet and let's start with late Beethoven. I've been playing cello for three months. Okay, so within reason. But if you're, um, if you happen to currently have a, a private teacher along with the cello in 30 days course you're studying with me the I, what I would say is you can start with t duets with your teacher I now um, how does the adult cello how do we find others to play with this is fun this is where I would try to look for like a local orchestra that's not gonna feel like a total in over your head situation there are believe it or not at least in the LA I know of a couple where it's like 
One's called Taco. It's terrible adult uh, orchestra, <laughs> but chamber orchestra, I think. I've never been to it, but I've heard good things about it. It's very low pressure, okay? And what I would do is try to g g find a group that you feel comfortable playing in. Even if you don't even play the concerts, you just want to join for the rehearsals and kind of get the experience of, of sitting in a group and trying to you know add as much as you can if, if the music's a little over your head. Um, and then when you're on break at rehearsal, you just start talking to the people around you and be like, you know, I just, I've been looking for someone to play with. Do you ever want to, if you find someone friendly in the cello section and they, you seem like your levels are s sympathetic to each other. So it'd be fun for both of you. You can be like, do you ever want to read duets? I just, I'm dying to like play music with other people. And I just, you know, would, would you like to read duets or maybe we could, you know, put a little group together or something like that. You can, that was, I actually did that um, and formed like a couple quartets in my student days where we just would get together and read through quartets. Sometimes we would practice them beforehand. Other times we would just say, we're going to just try sight reading this stuff. In these groups, we never actually performed publicly, but we just got together and like started playing together. So I think that that's a good way is just to find a group, um, that, you know, of other adult learners. Uh, and then the fear of playing with others. I think that comes down to finding the right people is a big part of that in the beginning. So I always had this kind of like, I want to be the weakest link because I'm, I'm, I was so determined to become a professional level player. So I was like, I, I don't like, I'll rise to the occasion. Just let me find the best players possible. And hopefully they won't like <laughs> hate me because <laughs> I'm the weak link currently. And, and then, but then there's the pressure that you have to like, I did a, probably more work than they did outside of our rehearsal times together uh, because I, I wanted to not be the weak link. I wanted to pleasantly surprise everyone. So that that's one attitude. The other one is just like you find people who are very friendly and aren't, they don't feel like they're light years ahead of you in whatever, like if they're a violinist and they've been playing professionally, unless you're like family friends or something, it might be a little intimidating to sit down and play duets with someone like that if you've been playing for a couple months, obviously. So just finding the right people and, and just sometimes even a person who's much better but is just a really nice person, it can be a very enjoyable experience for both of you um, because you're there to kind of enjoy making music and trying to play these pieces. It's, so it's not as much about like judgment. That, those, those are kind of my thoughts. So I hope that helps. This is from Melody Wong 728 Congratulations, Billy, from Hanzu, China. I hope I said that right. Um, it's amazing to share your family trip in South Korea as well as your tips about keeping a healthy body balance to play cello. Besides, I also believe physical therapy like acupuncture really works um, to relieve the pain. Uh, actually, I did a little acupuncture while I was in South Korea, and it definitely did help. So that was, it's funny you mentioned that. Um, my question, as beginners, what is your specific suggestions to practice flexibly and expressively? Do you encourage students to compose their simple piece, like a simple piece, um, I like your teaching method and analogy to play like the brain is singing with the cello. Yeah, I think uh, that's a great question. I think if you feel inclined to do something like that, I think it's a great thing to do because it's it, it's interacting with the cello as like an, a, an expressive tool and you're making music, you're even writing a composition that you're going to play. Um, that One thing I did, I didn't write many compositions because I didn't, that just wasn't something I felt compelled to do but I when I was going back to school for cello I would play like students who were in the same class but were composers I would play their works and it was a really fun thing even if what they wrote was seemed crazy difficult I would just give it a shot and it was very fun because I felt it almost felt more liberating and easier to play a student piece with with real artistic abandon than to try to play a concerto and I'm like looking on YouTube and I see I know where I'm at with the concerto, and then I see a nine-year-old who plays it perfectly already, and you're just, it's like, ugh, you know? So it's sometimes playing your own piece or playing a, a piece written by like a fellow student can open you up to just be a little less self-conscious about kind of where you are if you're at the start of your journey. So I think that's a great thing to do. And yeah, the brain is singing with the cello. I definitely believe in a sound-first approach. Um, and I think a lot of adult learners, we leave stuff on the table because we can get a little too fixated on doing everything perfectly with our technique and not as much about like kind of like going to a karaoke club and you just want to like 
sing your heart out, you know, and just, just kind of like technique is obviously important. And I focus on that in my teaching a hundred percent, but it's, it's also balanced with like trying to make music even on day one. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. Okay, this is Christopher White, uh, 2832. Here's another question. How much markup on shared pieces is reasonable? Okay, I'm talking bowings, fingerings, reminders when playing in a stand partner orchestra kind of situation. I seem to appreciate quite a few bowing notes, at least every few bars, and certainly fingering reminders are important. I don't want to annoy my stand partner. Okay, that's a great, great question. What I would say is that basically, the better the group is, like the more advanced the, the orchestra is you're playing in, the less you want to do your own personal markings, okay? It's not like a sin that'll get you excommunicated from cello forever, but that's just my own personal experience. I'll share an experience I had that was super embarrassing. Um, but now, bowings to me are not something you should ever limit because the bowings, if you're in a group, you the bowings have to be the, are usually supposed to be the same or at least coordinated between inner and outer stands. So bowings is, is like a group thing. What I, when, what I would say to limit is kind of like your own fingerings. And the, the biggest reason is because your stand partner may not necessarily use the same fingerings. And so then it's like the, the page is a little cluttered with your notes to yourself, and, but it might throw them off. So that being said, at the end of the day, I think it's, a lot of it just depends on who you're playing next to because you might be in a, you might, they might just, it might totally confuse them and, fr and like annoy them to have a bunch of fingerings or they might say, you know what, I don't, I just read the notes don't just go knock yourself out, like whatever helps you. So a lot of it is kind of who you play next to, but in general, the better the group, the less you kind of want to put your own stuff in there. I was doing a gig early on um, when I, it was, you know, the gig wasn't over my head, but we were playing a piece, it was an overture, and I think it was maybe a Wagner overture, but, or, or very German, very difficult, and it was, primarily an E major, and that was just a key I was not super familiar with yet, and I just took the part home, put fingerings all over the place, really practiced my heart out, but when I came back, it's like the day before the concert, and we're coming back from break, and some guy looks over at my stand, and he's like, oh my god, who put all those fingerings in? And I just, I was like, me, that, yeah, that's me, but it, it was just like a very embarrassing, and I quickly learned that it's, you know, it's, kind of bad form to just like litter a piece even if it's like without it i can't play this piece you still you you got to see what you can do not to do that okay this is from user jh2lu2bz3m <laughs> hi billy i have a question here how do you keep upper arm up while keeping the shoulder down when playing a and d strings i found myself struggling while playing on dna and it's super annoying yeah that's, so that's the first thing, is that you're, for everyone's body, and I'm actually not as flexible as I wish I were, but um, everyone's going to have a certain height that their elbow can raise before their shoulder starts to raise as well. So you kind of want to figure out a way to sit with the instrument and bow so that the majority of the time your elbow is at the, a good string, a good height so that you can sink weight into the string e easily, but not so high that your shoulder is, is raised at all times okay and again i'll say this i don't think it's a terrible thing if your shoulder raises sometimes while you're bowing but it needs to lower again that's that's a big thing okay um with the d and the a string especially and especially the a string a lot of times what you need to check is to make sure that on the a string in the second half of the bow from the middle to the tip that you're you're really going out far enough and by out far i mean your hand like over your right foot. So really like this kind of a direction and not just pulling and then kind of allowing the, just thinking on like a more two dimensional plane. And then your, your shoulder is just, there's nowhere, at a certain point, there's nowhere else for your arm to go. And so it's gonna, your shoulder's gonna start coming up. So if you think out this way, it's if you look at my shoulder, let's say I'm here, and then I go to the tip, and I end up here, it's it's much easier for me to keep my shoulder down if I'm if I'm adding enough outward shape in the and it's like the three-dimensional U shape that curves away from the cello at the further you get out. Okay, so I think that might be that might be it actually on the A string. Um, so I would just take take a look at the three-dimensional shape you're carving and, and make sure you're going out far enough.
Okay, this is at Susan Korski, 9852. Hey, Billy. 20k subscribers congrats thank you so much um i would like to ask you about a bow question do you play down bow on the inside hairs of the bow and up bow on the outside of the bow hairs or do you play on full flat of the hair um i've just been playing a year and you're my only teacher you're amusing amazing communicator uh safe travels back from south korea thank you so much um do love how you plan your day around nap time with my with the baby yeah <laughs> um sue okay sue so yeah what i do is as a default when i play i have the hair tilted towards me the stick towards me about 45 degrees okay and that is pretty consistent even at the tip okay so i basically have the have it tilted towards me that helps with the alignment for my arm and i, I want to keep like a really good alignment at all times if i go to flat hair I just find that my my wrist, the way I, my arm is and the way I play, it would it ends up wanting to be a little bit more bent. And actually, what um, this is something that Leonard Rose talked about a lot in his teaching. The thing with the having your angle, the bow angled towards you slightly. If you look down as you sink weight into the into the bow and into the string, you, the rest of the hair is going to come down. So it doesn't mean that I'm only playing on half of the hair at all times every time i like make a u-shaped bow stroke and i sink my weight in the the rest of the hair engages usually okay um so i don't think it really makes a big difference in terms of like sound you do get probably like you're gonna get a stronger like more powerful sound if you're always on the flat of the hair um and i do know people who are like top players and that's their default so it's I don't think there's a wrong way or a right way, but that's what I do is I always have it tilted towards me. I never have the stick tilted away from me. That's more of a violin thing. So violinists, they, they tilt so that the, the stick actually moves away from their face. I never have the stick tilted away from my face when I'm playing. Okay, so it's either, it's either flat. Sometimes I do play with flat hair in certain circumstances, um, or most of the time it's tilted towards me. Great question. And finally, at Ada5950, started my tailor journey 10 months ago, congrats. My goal is to eventually play with others. How long can that take? That can, I mean, it can depend on what you mean by that and, and kind of your comfort. So if you have a private teacher and you, like for example, my favorite book to start people with is The Piatti Cello Method. Those etudes in The Piatti Cello Method are written as duets that can be played you play cello one and your teacher plays cello two. So you can basically start playing with your teacher duets, um, you know, from the start. And let me tell you, that was actually what hooked me. I actually didn't start on the Piatti. I started on a book by a guy named Coomer, who is another uh, old dead pedagogue who is real famous. But he also had, you know, duet style etudes in the beginning. And the first time it was like a week in or two weeks in and we played it. She's like, okay, let's try it as a duet just for fun. And I was so blown away. It was like two plus two equals six. And my hairs were standing up on the, on my arm. So even if you're just playing with your teacher, it can be an incredibly musically satisfying experience. Um, and in terms of playing with groups, like, like an orchestral group, it depends on kind of how how much you're practicing, how fast you're learning, stuff like that. I, I don't, it's hard to put a time on it, but you know, I, I said this earlier in a question, there are groups that are kind of catered towards like people who are getting started. And so if there's a, a local group that's like, we're an adult ensemble, the point here is for us all to like learn and, and have our kind of our first ensemble experience together. You can start one of those early with without the pressure of feeling like I have to play all the notes. So that can be a great thing. Um, otherwise, I'd say it, it's more about milestones. I think once you're playing notes and you're playing various scales and you, you're confident like shifting, I think that's a, a pretty good time when you could start looking to play with others. Maybe like a, you find a couple people make a little quartet with and play you know, quartet pieces that are, are not super challenging. But um, I, I wouldn't like hide from it if you're interested in doing that i'd say just give it a shot if you find that it was like wow that was like kind of embarrassing and i really felt out of my depth okay maybe it's a little early but 
I, you know, you don't, you don't want to wait too long and just miss out on all that fun because it's really motivating and really exciting when you play in a group and it goes well and you're just like, oh my God, I can't wait to do that again. All right, so there you have it. That's all the questions. And now for the big reveal, uh, the winner picked randomly is Steve Zercher. Okay, so go ahead and send me a message. Uh, my email is billy at adultcello.com and uh, congratulations. I can't wait to work with you over Zoom for a one hour lesson. And thank you to everyone else who wrote in questions. They were fantastic and I hope my answers were extremely helpful for everyone. And uh, yeah, I, I look forward to the next big milestone with this YouTube channel. Thank you so much. If you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing. I'd really appreciate it. Thanks so much and see you next time.